So with that in mind, um, so my talk today is about a Python module that I wrote um, called Pidentify. Um, bit cheesy, I know, but never mind. Um, and it's for performing identifiability analysis using Capazzi. So the way I'm going to structure this presentation then, I'm going to um, briefly introduce a model that I'm calling the FOS DFOS model. Very simple, just phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. And hopefully I'll justify the need for identifiability analysis. Um, then I'll talk about the method of identifiability analysis that I'm using, called parameter profile likelihood. Um, then I'll discuss identify and the features of identify, um, followed up with an example, and then I'll go back and perform identifiability analysis for the FOSD FOS model. So the FOSD FOS model, very simple. Um, A gets phosphorylated at rate K FOS. Okay. Um, A gets phosphorylated at the rate K FOS, um, and dephosphorylated at the rate K DFOS, and as you might expect, um, the system converges to a steady state. So the question is, if I remove these parameters, can I find them again by fitting the A phosphorylated vector, as we often do in sometimes have in systems biology? Um, so that's what I did. Um, so the models fit back to the simulated A FOS vector um, 10,000 times, three parameters. Three parameters were estimated: um, the initial concentration of A, the phosphorylated parameter, and the dephosphorylation parameter. Um, on the left here, we have the um, all of the parameter sets um, represented as uh, the residual sum of squares objective function. Um, and on the right, we have the top one percent of the parameter sets. And what I want to highlight with this slide is that when you look at the all of the data together, the distribution of the parameters. Um, if you look at the KDFOS parameter, we span four orders of magnitude. And then if you look at the top 1% of, param uh, of parameter estimation runs, um, the KDFOS parameter still spans four orders of magnitude. So why is this? Why is the optimization pro um, process having so much difficulty with this parameter? Um, so let's look at this data from another angle. Um, on the right, we have the Pearson's correlation heat map. On the left, we have um, a scatter graph showing a plot of the parameter estimation runs for the phosphorylated versus the dephosphorylated parameter. Um, and as you can see, there's a very high um, linear correlation. So when the dephosphorylation parameter is low, the phosphorylation parameter is high, and vice versa. Um, so what, what I think is happening here is that the, uh, the optimization algorithm can't change one parameter without changing the other. Um, I, they can compensate for each other in the optimization process. Um, and they are non-identifiable. So, um, with that then, um, what is identifiability analysis? Um, and I hope people agree with me here. Um, so identifiability analysis provides information on uh, whether parameters can be uniquely determined uh, to a degree of confidence in a given estimation problem. Um, so several methods of identif identifiability analysis exist. Um, the one I'll talk about today um, was published by Andrews Rao in 2009. It's called the Parameter Profile Life and Approach. Um, and basically what you're doing is a parameter scan of parameter estimations, and you do that for each parameter. Um, so mathematically, that, look, that looks like this. Um, so you minimize the residual sum of squares objective function for all parameters except from your parameter of interest um, for a range of parameters, uh, parameter values of your parameter of interest. Um, so to reiterate that, so you optimize your model to the data, you find the global minimum for what you think is the global minimum, um, re-optimize for all of the other parameters, um, except the new parameter of interest, and then you repeat step two for a range of parameter values, and then calculate the confidence intervals. So in 2012, Jörg Jor Schaber uh, published a method to do this using Capazzi. And essentially the way it works is that you perform an optimization, um, you find the parameters that you want to minimize, um, then you copy the capacity file, one for each of your parameters, um, and then you open up each of your capacity files, you define a reports definition to collect your results, create a scan item, um, remove your parameter of interest from the estimation task, um, run your scan task, and then visualize the results. Um, this isn't fun. Um, this is a, a tedious process and um, error prone. Um, but that's where Pidentify comes in. So Pidentify is a Python module that automates the process of setting up profile likelihoods um, calculations using Capazzi. And it can do so for any model that's compatible with Capazzi, uh, for any par uh, parameter set, and for an arbitrary number of parameter sets. Um, so 
briefly then I'll explain how the Pi works. Um, so you've got two major features. Um, you can, one, you can um, calculate the profile likelihoods around the parameter set, which is currently in the model. Um, or two, if you have some parameter estimation data, whether simulated in Capazi or uh, elsewhere, you can um, calculate profile likelihoods around um, any parameter set you like, um, any number of times. So we have four classes, um, two on each side, one for initialization, one for visualization and um, calculation of confidence intervals. And um, down the bottom here, we can see an example of code. Um, and the whole idea of this was to try and make it easy to use and quick to use. Um, so both sections, both sides, um, work with four lines of code. So to demonstrate then, um, I'm going to use a published model from 2006 uh, by Villa et al. Um, it's TGF beta receptor internalization. <coughs> TGF beta binds to its receptors, gets internalized and degraded both constitutively and uh, living dependent by SMAC7. Um, and we also have some receptor recycling back to the cell surface as well in this model. So I simulated some data using capacity from the model, added some, uh, some noise using Python, um, and then fit the model back to the network uh, to see what would happen. Here we have the residual sum of squares objective function for 10,000 runs, and that actually is a, is a very good. Um, uh, distribution. Uh, normally they don't look like that. Um, okay, so of course I then use identifiability analysis to use my program to assess the profile likelihoods of these parameters. Um, I'm not going to show you all of them, there's 14 parameters in the model. Um, these two uh, are examples of identifiable parameters and they're identifiable because the uh, both arms in both directions cross this interval, this confidence interval line. Uh, so if all of your parameters in your model have a profile which is similar to this, um, your model is called identifiable. So this model that I uh, tested um, also has non-identifiable parameters. Um, on the left we have a practical non-identifiability because the profile isn't flat, but we don't extend above the confidence interval line in one or both directions. Um, on the right we have the structural non-identifiability. Um, yeah, so uh, we have a structural non identifiability because the, um, the profile is completely flat, i.e., it doesn't um, contribute or a change in the parameter value, doesn't contribute to a change in the objective function value uh, when it varied. So um, I want to finish then by going back to the phosphorylation dephosphorylation model and um, using this program on it. Um, so, of course, that's, that's what I've done. I've run 10,000 parameters parameter estimations and performs identifiability around the best of those, um, measured by the residual sum of squares objective function. Um, and the first thing we notice is that the actual um, estimated parameters were orders of magnitude out. Um, and at least around this parameter set, um, all, all of these parameters appear to be structurally not identifiable. Um, so actually it's quite interesting that when you, um, you look at other parameter sets, these profiles vary. Um, they're not always the same. Um, so I'm not really sure what's going on there, but uh, it's interesting. So then I had a question, um, can this non-identifiability be resolved with more data? Um, so I added the A, um, non-phosphorylated form A into the trajectories, uh, into the parameter estimation, sorry, um, and did the whole process again. So now the phosphorylated parameter is now apparently identifiable, but the other two remain practically non-identifiable. Um, so this was also a little bit confusing given that I've read elsewhere that uh, structural non-identifiability has to be resolved by changing the network. Um, so I wanted to present that to you guys. Um, so of course as well actually you could, um, you could measure um, the absolute concentrations of one of your uh, non-identifiable parameters um, and then fix that parameter. Um, and don't include it in the estimation um, or you could fix to another sensible value or um, if all else fails, change the network topology. So in summary then, identifiability is, an eva is a valuable tool for parameter estimation, and um, profile likelihoods can be calculated with Capazi, um, but with some difficulty. Um, but PyIdentify automates this process, um, which will save hours of time, um, and also facilitates facilities to calculate profile likelihoods around any arbitrary number of parameter sets. Um, and I'd like to thank my supervisor for um, letting me onto this project, um, as well as everybody else in my uh, Newcastle lab.
um, and PNG who are funding my project. several processes at once and just run them all at the same time, which will destroy your, <laughs> destroy it. You won't be able to do anything else with your computer in the meantime. Uh, but there's also, um, I've built in, if you have access to a Sun Grid Engine cluster, you can submit them individually to the cluster, which is what I do. Um, but there's also... So is it, uh, is this uh, distribution embedded in, in Python 5 or can, can you use Python 5 directly on the cluster? Or? Yes. Um, well, well, you, you, copy, you copy the module over um, as the, the, the module, the module file, and just use it in another script. Um, but something I'd like to say as well, um, this uh, pl.run method, um, if I could have an optional argument here saying mode equals SGE for some grid engine, um, but it could be quite easy to, uh, to write another piece of code to submit to another cluster um, the word, uh, software, so it's extendable. Sorry. How do you calculate the level of these ah, confidence for doing the confidence intervals? Um, so it's a likelihood ratio based confidence line based on the chi-square distribution and an asymptotic theory that I don't understand anything about. So it's just an equation um, that was published in your Shabbos and as well as uh, Andrea's Rell's paper. 